coming to you from the mobile Hudson Media Group studio right here in the Uribe compound. This is Talking Politics, and I am New Jersey's premier journalist, top 100 Latino via the Latino Spirit Online magazine for 2020 and 2021, and of course, the sworn enemy of all the toxic progressives, social justice clowns, and all the woke fools throughout Hudson County and of course throughout the state of New Jersey. Yes, it's me. Fernando Uribe. Hope you all had a wonderful holiday. Hopefully all of you had a very Merry Christmas. As you can tell, I'm Latino, so my Christmas tree is still up in early January. And of course, why wouldn't it be? And certainly hope you all having a wonderful start to 2022. There is a lot to discuss, so let's get started. Here's what I'm thinking about right now. Ladies and gentlemen, obviously this is the week of January the 6th, and I'm sure that on our social media news feeds and, of course, on primetime cable news or cable news for all for that matter, we'll be, you know, talking about what went on a year ago as, as I'm filming this show today here on January the 6th. And I'll be very honest with you. I'm one of those conservatives that, quite frankly, doesn't care. I don't care about any anniversary. I don't care about all the meltdowns and tantrums that the liberal media is having about what happened a year ago at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., but I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't care about democracy. It's not because I don't care about my country. It's because, folks, I care about highlighting the blatant hypocrisy by the liberal media. And of course, I've been one of those few journalists to talk about this because going back to the summer of 2020, you know, the summer of destruction by BLM, right? The Black Lives Matter uh, chapters all throughout the country. Yes, folks, that is what really concerned me because we're, you know, a little under two years from when that happened. And of course, you know what? Not one prosecution has been put forth by anybody that destroyed public and private property during, once again, the summer of destruction, courtesy of BLM and all of its, you know, protesters or activists or those that were, you know, peaceful. Well, let me just say this. And again, as I look at the images that are, you know, we're bombarded with for the last, I don't know, 48 hours on our news feeds, on cable news about what happened, you know, last January the 6th in 2021. And folks, let me be very clear again. Yes, that was a riot. Yes, that was unnecessary. And certainly for anyone that is that got arrested and will be prosecuted. Yes, you know what? You should go to jail. It's as simple as that. However, though, that's not the same mantra that we heard from district attorneys in cities all across the country, right? Right here in Hudson County, we look at New York City every single day. And what did we see throughout the summer of 2020? Again, the summer of destruction, courtesy of BLM, and even into the fall, we saw private buildings, businesses being looted, being destroyed. We saw cop cars being vandalized. Molotov cocktails, which include homemade explosives, being thrown at police officers and their vehicles. And you know what? Despite the fact that, of course, thankfully, Bill de Blasio is no longer mayor, good riddance to that clown. But certainly during his eight years, did we ever see any emphasis on law enforcement or the preservation of the quality of life in New York City? Of course not. We saw New York City become a wasteland. It became, listen, again, I have to sort of bite my tongue here and keep the show PG, but, you know, it became an absolute blank hole. And we all know what that means. It, it, it rhymes with the word quit for any of you that maybe are a little bit slow at home. But in any event, folks, you know, all I'm hearing from, you know, the typical columnists in various New Jersey news sites across the state or even on primetime cable news, right? We all know the usual suspects, right? CNN, uh, also, you know, the uh, the lack of journalists, if you want to call them that, uh, at MSNBC, the people, you know, masquerading as journalists, you know, at the New York Times, at the Washington Post, hell, even here in New Jersey, right? Whether it's NJ.com, the Star Ledger, and other news outlets, right, where columnists will be t writing about, oh, what January 6th meant and what this insurrection did to them and how they don't sleep at night and how they're still traumatized and how they're, you know, some of them had to go for grief counseling and some of them are still not recovered. Give me a break. You're grown ass men and women. If that triggered you and if you're still having trouble sleeping, let me tell you something. You got bigger problems than January 6th, 2021. Okay. And that's just the truth. Okay. And folks, one of the things that I'm very, very concerned about is the idea that we're still sort of carrying across this narrative, 
Okay, for any of you that watch the news, I mean, listen, we had the joke of a vice president, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, whatever, whatever her name is, right? You know, talking about comparing this insurrection to the attacks of 9-11 and also what happened at Pearl Harbor. Folks, I mean, to say nothing of the fact that this hyena can't probably, you know, finish a sentence without chuckling, which I'm surprised she, she was actually able to get through that entire speech without, you know, nyang, 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 because that's all she does, right? She she can't help but laugh at every single question posed to her, right? I mean, she can't even finish a sentence without that obnoxious, insufferable laugh from this woman. But you know what? When I heard that from a sitting vice president, I was embarrassed. I'm thinking to myself, my God, 81 million people voted for this nonsense, for this clown and for her superior, right? The president of the United States. I mean, don't even get me started on that one. But the fact is, folks, again, if you want me to start caring about January 6th, then you know what? Cities across the country, blue cities specifically, should start caring about prosecuting people that destroyed thousands of businesses, that in some instances cost lives. But you won't hear that from the liberal media. You won't, because remember, in, during the summer of destruction, courtesy of BLM, all we heard about, well, you know, we have to, you know, strive for justice, right? And, you know, and inspire change. And, you know, we can all do this, right? All these little catchphrases that became popular hashtags, right? Whether it was honoring a career criminal, right? Like George Floyd, who had more fentanyl in his system than what's sold on the corner of Market Street in Newark on a daily basis. I don't know. I mean, it's amazing to me who we're going to put on a pedestal and who we're going to honor and who we're going to, you know, push for justice for. That's all I heard in the summer and the fall of 2020. And again, cities burned to the ground. Take your pick. New York City, Philadelphia, Camden, Baltimore, uh, Atlanta, you know, Cleveland, St. Louis, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, you know, I think somewhere in Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis. Folks, take your pick about what you saw in terms of images. Businesses being burned to the ground. Businesses that have never recovered. People who lost their lives, possibly. Law enforcement officers who were absolutely pummeled with abuse, both physical and verbal. But again, the liberal media will have, you know, are, are going to have a party in their pants. And whatever gets them hard, I mean, whatever. That's your business. But folks, be consistent. And again, when we talk about, oh, wanting to prosecute people from January the 6th, well, let's just look at what's going on in New York City, for example, folks. And again, this is just a continuation of the Bill de Blasio years. But for example, the new district attorney in Manhattan has ordered his prosecutors to stop seeking prison sentences for a multitude of criminals and downgrade felony charges in cases including armed robberies, and drug dealing, according to a set of progressive policies that were made public by the office of the district attorney of the city of New York. Folks, again, this is a continuation of what we saw during the Bill de Blasio years. But it's not just New York City that's guilty of this. We also saw it in cities, again, like I just mentioned, where they didn't want to prosecute anybody that looted, vandalized, and destroyed cities and ultimately burned many of them to the ground during the summer and fall, during the summer of destruction, courtesy of BLM. But you want me to care about January the 6th and about, again, what you want to call an insurrection? You can call it whatever you want, folks. Yes, it was a riot. Yes, it was wrong. And whoever, again, engaged in the destruction of public property, those that assaulted law enforcement officers, you know what? Prosecute them. That's fine. I don't have an issue with them. See, folks, unlike a lot of my liberal colleagues in, in media, I'm intellectually honest and I'm philosophically consistent. So I'll continue again and I'll say it. Hey, you want to talk about prosecutions and what you want to be in an uproar about? Not a problem. But folks, I didn't see any prosecutions in any, in any of the aforementioned cities during the summer and fall of destruction, courtesy of BLM. But you want me to care about what happened on January the 6th? Hey, sorry, I'm not going to do it. And that doesn't make me a lack of a patriot. That doesn't make me someone who's un-American. You know what that makes me? That makes me someone with common sense. Someone that can see through all of the bull crap brought to you by the liberal media at the national level. And of course, here in New Jersey, we all know the suspects, folks. We don't know who they are. I've listed them before. I've discussed them before. And accordingly, and rightfully so, I've trashed them before. So during this week of January the 6th, you know, for Hispanics like myself, again, who, who still has his Christmas tree up, you know what? I think of it as Three Kings Day. For all of us Catholics, we all know the significance of that holiday and what it means to us. 
But if you want me to sit here and wallow in, I don't know, in despair and depression and, you know, be crying my eyes out because of what happened at the Capitol building and, oh my God, you know, m multiple, you know, um, people in Congress were scared for their lives. You, they, were, they were fine. Stop. You're grown ass adults. All right. Stop being a bunch of, you know, what's okay. I can't, you know, say it on the air. It rhymes with wussy. Okay. If you want to be specific. All right, and at least you'll infer what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Folks, listen, when it comes to January the 6th, stop bitching and moaning about it. You should be bitching and moaning about the summer and fall of destruction, courtesy of BLM. And when we see prosecutions in the same manner, we see the same fixation by the liberal media on this, that's when I'll care about January the 6th. In the meantime, Take your despair, take your fake outrage, take your sanctimonious nonsense, and you know exactly where to stick it, because that's exactly where it belongs. And that's what I'm thinking about right now. In the latest edition of the five-time award-winning podcast, Talk in the Hudson, which you can listen to live every Wednesday night by going to www.blogtalkradio.com slash talk in the Hudson, was the founder and publisher of Hut Post, James De Los Santos. Of course, we spoke for over an hour on a plethora of very interesting topics, and here are some highlights for your consideration. First of all, we talked about perhaps the biggest breaking news over the holiday season, and that was the imminent retirement of U.S. Representative Albio Ceres, here who represents the 8th Congressional District in New Jersey, and certainly who is going to be replacing him on the ballot. It is none other than the son of senior United States Senator Robert Menendez, and indeed it'll be Robert Menendez Jr., it's been a lot of uproar about what this candidacy means, and James had a lot to say about it. Let's see what he had to say. James, the biggest news this holiday season uh, was the retirement of U.S. Representative Albio Ceres, you know, a lifelong West New Yorker, former uh, principal at Memorial High School, former athlete, um, former legislator in Trenton. And obviously, he has been our representative in the House of Representatives for you know, a good amount of years now. Uh, he has decided to retire. Um, and he was really transparent about it too, James. He, 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 he made no bones about it. He was like, you know, you kind of expect Republicans to win the House, which is what history tells us, uh, at least during midterms. And he was very honest. He's like, I have no desire to be part of a Republican majority. He's stepping down. And it seems like all the stars are aligning for the son of U.S. Senator Robert Menendez, his son, Robert Menendez Jr., to apparently, I guess, be – appointed to that seat and run for that seat, I guess, this June during the primary. Uh, what were your thoughts when you heard about the news about Robert Jr.? Uh, that was a surprise. The actual Albio Sierra's retirement, I, that was a rumor that happened as soon as the election was over about two years ago. So it finally coming to light. You know, I think a lot of people behind the scenes already knew that was going to happen. But for Bob Menendez Jr. to have all those endorsements lined up the day that Albio Series announced his retirement, that was very surprising, especially for, you know, someone that I don't think the community sees as someone who's around. But I, I would understand that amongst the, you know, what I would say the political elites of Hudson County, that they would, you know, that they would be back, you know, the son of Bob Menendez, the, the senator of New Jersey. Well, what was interesting, though, is – and I know Robert personally. He's a good friend of mine. We talk weekly. Uh, we've gone out for lunch. I mean, I like Robert. We get along very well. And it was interesting because, let's be honest, you know, going into 2021 or at the end of 2020, there was a lot of, there was a lot of whispers, James, that um, he was going to challenge Stephen Fulop in Jersey City. And that was probably the one guy that Stephen Fulop was terrified of because, again, as we all know, there's, there's this ongoing – I don't want to use the word hatred, but there's there, there's some, you know, disdain. There's some tension there between uh, Mayor Fulop and, 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 and U.S. Senator Robert Menendez, Sr. Um, that's been going on going back to years because of, you know, allegations of this and that. And we may never know the true story, but the point is that that tension exists. And, you know, James, listen, I'm part Cuban. So and one thing about us Cubans, man, we don't forget. And we, we keep receipts. And, you know... We know how to hold grudges, and it seems like the senator, you know, has been holding a grudge against against Stephen Fulop for those years since, you know, it was alleged that Stephen Fulop was trying to 
get his way into that Senate seat. If everyone remembers, back in the, you know, sometime in the fall of 28, I'm sorry, the, the fall of 2017 or the spring of 2017, uh, 2018, um, the senator was on trial. Um, and it seemed like there were some whispers that uh, Stephen Phillips thought that Bob Menendez was going to get convicted and he was going to lose a Senate seat and that would open it up. And of course, you know, yet you know, people like there are names like Robert Torricelli, former senator's name, uh, and Stephen Fulop. Now, Stephen Fulop denies that to this day. We, we may never know the true story, but the bottom line is that that tension's been there for years. And you know, Junior's name was being floated as a potential challenger to uh, Stephen Fulop for the mayor race in 2021. Obviously, in 2020, the pandemic hit. We were stuck indoors, and by the time 2021 came around, we were still trying to recover. It seemed like maybe the window closed politically for Robert Menendez Jr. People said, oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe this is not his cycle. You might have to wait until 2025 to either run for a council seat or run for mayor. That's no longer the case. It seems like the, all the dominoes were put in a row and they fell for him as now it seems like he's going to be the next U.S. representative up here in the 9th Congressional District, James. Yeah, I know definitely he's going to be in the primary in the, in the Democrat uh, primary, so that's going to be interesting, especially seeing that new progressive party that's very active so far in Hudson County. Uh, that that will be interesting to see how how much the mm-hmm. machine holds up against, you know. Secondly, we discussed the direction that the Democrat Party is taking currently and what could await them in 2022 during the upcoming midterm elections. Let's hear what James had to say about it. Oh, it seems like Democrats at the highest of levels have not been delivering on things that, you know, that they promised. And again, you know, I know you check out my social media. I know I say a lot of things because I'm a smart (laughs) ass and because I like to be witty. But, you know, I keep harping on people that, hey, you know, you're not seeing mean tweets anymore, right? So that's what, hey, that's what matters, right? Hey, okay, well... You fill up your gas tank, well, hey, at least you're not seeing mean tweets anymore. Hey, you know, uh, supermarket shopping, it's a little expensive to go grocery shopping. Hey, well, at least you're not seeing mean tweets anymore. You know, I say it in jest, but what's interesting, though, James, is that, you know, and we dissected a lot, obviously. There are a lot of things I found personally wrong with the 45th president, but it seems like the bill of goods we were sold by the 46th president have not materialized. And I don't want to hear people talk about, oh, well, it's, COVID. it's beyond COVID. It's policy. It's not kind of sticking to what you ran on in, in your campaign. And now it's like, well, you know, people that, again, I just, I find it funny where on January 20th of 2021, man, my news feed was inundated with the love fest, right? Remember, it was peaches and unicorns and everybody was all so happy and rainbows and everybody, you know, our, our student loans were going to be paid off. And, you know, the air was going to smell cleaner and the food was going to taste better. And to be honest, man, it's a year later, inflation, bad policies, you know, it's, it's almost like Democrats can't seem to get out of their own way. It starts at the top with the president and it seems to be filtering its way down to the rest of the party. Um, is that a fair assessment of the way I'm looking at it? I, I, yeah, I believe so. I think, yeah, like, also with the governor of New Jersey and, and with the president. Like, with the president, like, he, he probably was promising that he was going to have stimulus checks, that he was going to cancel student loans, and that we were going to have, you know, a massive vaccine rollout that everyone was going to have availability and that testing would be availability. But now we have long lives in Hudson County where people are waiting eight days to receive a test that they're supposed to get the result in a half hour. So mm-hmm. things like, you know, it's, 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 when, it's easy to, you know, to bark at the person in charge, and then when you get in charge, you do the same thing. So I think now the Democrats don't have a leg to stand on. They've been barking and saying the Republicans are the bad people, and Trump was the reason why everything was the way that it is. And now they're in charge. They have the they have the house, the house and the Senate, and they're still not passing the bills they promised they would. So you know, I, if it's mm-hmm. not the leadership, it's the people within the party that are holding it back. So, oh, James, so a person like wonderful. Steve Sweeney, like a person like Steve Sweeney, you know? Yeah, 
the reason why he lost, he was a person holding back a lot of things that you know people wanted to happen in the in, in the in the state. So that's that's my assessment of things going on. Oh, you know, it's you know, leadership, I, but it's also the people with inside it. Well, James beautifully said that. Beautifully said. That. Once again, it was a very interesting interview with Hut Post founder and publisher James De Los Santos. And you listen to the episode once again in its entirety by going to www.blogtalkradio.com slash talk in the Hudson. You can download the episode and listen to it anywhere at any time from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet. And these are the exclusives I'll continue to bring you, ladies and gentlemen, every single week on Blog Talk Radio as the podcast approaches its fifth year on the air this March. And now for some local stories for your consideration. Let's start off with arguably the biggest news story during the holiday break. And that was the retirement of U.S. Representative Abio Siris here in the 8th Congressional District, and subsequently Robert Menendez Jr. being tapped as his successor. Now, here are some details and a nice job by Matt Friedman via Politico for his report on this story. Now, longtime U.S. Representative Abio Siris will retire this year, and Robert Menendez Jr., again, the son of the senior United States Senator Robert Menendez Sr., has been already garnering support to replace the congressman in New Jersey's heavily Democratic 8th Congressional District. Now, Ceres, who is 70 years old, announced he would retire at the end of the current term in January of 2023, after serving in Congress since January of 2006. Subsequently, Albio Ceres was tapped by Democrats in that district to fill the House seat held for years by Robert Menendez Sr., who also ascended to the U.S. Senate that same year. Now, numerous sources did confirm that Robert Menendez Sr. was making the rounds with Democrats around Hudson County to ensure that his son would be able to get the support necessary to get on the ballot during the upcoming June primary. Now, the Cuban-born Sears is, once again, the former mayor of West New York, my hometown, as a matter of fact, folks, proud tiger here, and was speaker of the, of the state assembly here in New Jersey, and who was a Republican for much of the 1980s and 90s, but... In Congress, Sears like Menendez, who was also of Cuban heritage, being born in the U.S. as well, was and continues to be a vocal critic of the Castro regime. Uh, Sears also chairs the House Foreign Affairs Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. Now, folks, this is newsworthy because, as we all know, Albio Sears is in very good health. And he did mention during a recent statement that he had no interest in running for another term, seeing that most likely Republicans will win the House coming up in the fall of 2022. Now, what's interesting though, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Congressman is pretty much on the money. We know that during every midterm, for the most part, historically, the opposing party tends to win the House of Representatives. Now, for all you history fans like myself, uh, it didn't happen actually twice in probably the last century or so, but in 2002, during the first midterms of President George W. Bush, Republicans actually kept the House and actually won some seats. Same thing happened in 1932 under Democrat Franklin Roosevelt when Democrats held the House and they were able to keep the House and subsequently also add seats. That doesn't seem to be the case this year, folks. We all know what's coming. It's a red tsunami. Democrats in Congress, especially in the House, are terrified about what's going on. We've seen a lot of retirements. I think we know what's coming in November of 2022. Now, whether or not uh, U.S. Representative Sirius feels that same way, I don't know, but he made it very clear he has no desire to serve in a Republican House. So, Maybe it was the best time for him to step down. And I'll tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you might say, oh, well, Fernando's just being partisan. He's being he's playing favorites because he knows Robert Jr. Yeah, Rob's a friend of mine. We have lunch. We talk regularly. He's a good guy. All right. And if there's anyone that I could think of to replace Albio Sirius in the House of Representatives, it's Robert Menendez Jr., folks. He's an accomplished attorney. He's a commissioner of the Port Authority. He's a family man. He's a good guy. If there's anyone you want representing you in your congressional district, it's Robert Menendez Jr. There, I said it. You want to call me a homer? You want to call me plain favorites? Whatever you want to call it. Folks, that's just the truth. And when you shave through all the layers and all the political BS that journalists are going through, you're going to realize, too, Robert Menendez Jr. will be a great fit in the House of Representatives once, hopefully, he wins this November and takes his seat in January of 2023. And now let's move to the Mouse Square City of Hoboken, and thank you, John Hines, for his report with Hudson County View on this story. Mike Russo, the 
Hoboken City Councilman out of the third ward was selected to be the new council president in Hoboken with Councilwoman at large Emily Jabor voted in as a vice president. Now Russo was first elected in 2003 and is currently serving his fifth term and was nominated by Jabor who was seconded by Councilman at large Joe Quintero. Second Ward Councilman Tiffany Fisher nominated Councilman at large Jim Doyle but did not receive a second. Russo's nomination was approved by a margin of eight to zero with one person abstaining. Coincidentally, it was Tiffany Fisher. Uh, quote, I'm going to abstain and councilman, and I'm hopeful we can work this year on our relationship to do what we can to have a better relationship throughout the course of the year, according to Councilwoman Tiffany Fisher. Uh, that's going to be reported early this week that Russo would get the nod for council president. Russo then put Jabor's name forward for vice president, which was seconded once again by Doyle. On Thursday morning, Hoboken Mayor Ravi Bala congratulated Russo and Jabor and said he looked forward to working with both of them. Mayor said, quote, I offer my congratulations to Councilman Russo and Councilwoman Jabor for achieving the role of Council President and Council Vice President. I look forward to working collaboratively with Council leadership and improving the quality of life for Hoboken residents on a number of initiatives in the year ahead. Well, that remains to be seen, folks, as we all know that the city of Hoboken continues to be very expensive. We're seeing development. We're seeing these high-rise condos going up, uh, predominantly rentals. And these are astronomical costs. I mean, to some extent, when you see this much development, it also has a trickle-down effect because it'll affect property owners throughout the city. Property taxes will go up because home values will go up. Again, I don't have to be a realtor, folks. I don't, I don't need to take my real estate test and get my license to know this. But it's been happening all, th all throughout Hudson County, but most specifically in Hoboken. You see it along Frank Sinatra Drive. You see it along sort of the northern part of the city and even the downtown part of the city. Now, whether or not the mayor and the new council president will be working on issues like, I don't know, maybe trying to get more parking because we all know Hoboken is deeply congested. Or the idea about, hey, and it's a story that's also being uh, floated around with a lot of discussion and debate, the cost of a new high school in Hoboken. Um, you know, listen. Let's let's see if the new mayor, well, the new council president, along with the new council vice president and the mayor, again, who won uh, another term uncontested this past November, can work together to improve the lives of Hoboken residents. And we'll see if that happens. But I'll definitely, I'll definitely keep you posted, folks. It's a story you definitely want to keep your eye on for. Staying in the Mile Square City of Hoboken, and a special thank you to Terry West with the Jersey General for her report on this story, became very evident at Hoboken's first public portion of the Board of Education meeting held earlier this week to discuss plans for a new taxpayer-funded high school, well, it got people very energized and rightfully so. Now, many didn't realize how many others shared their view. And of course, the passion and the energy in the room soon brought a lot of residents to sort of mobilize together in a coalition against the school board's plan. Now, here are some details which make the story very interesting. As the date of a January 25th referendum is approaching, on a $241 million bond to be voted on to help build the school, and that's quickly approaching, groups are already hitting the street to mobilize against it. Members have created signs and slogans and plan to canvas until election day so that residents know what's on the ballot and ultimately how it might affect them. According to Pavel Sokolov, one of the Hoboken residents who helped organize the group along with uh, Matt Mayer, quote, when people say this is a grassroots community movement, this is one of those instances where it really is. Now, member motivations may vary. Some see the timing of the vote and its presentations to the community as an attempt at voter suppression. Of course, folks, those are the typical leftists and the progressives and all the woke fools in Hoboken that want to cry race and gender for anything when they're not going to get their way or when they want to make a point. Oh, that's, you know, it's identity politics. It's the blueprint of the left, right? Which I'm not surprised about. But it's not really about that, folks. It's about the fact that this is going to cost Hoboken residents and even the ones that are even struggling the most. So, for example, seniors that are living on a fixed income are concerned about what would ultimately be a $496 spike in annual property taxes, and that's ultimately for the average homeowner. For others, they see it as an issue of equity. Now, the referendum in question would allow the Hoboken School Board to execute a plan to build a new four-story school on the site of JFK Stadium and convert the existing high school into a middle school. Now, the state-of-the-art facility would have an ice hockey rink, which they don't need, a competition-sized pool, which they still don't need, a rooftop football field, which, again, Hoboken football is still very popular and still very competitive in Hudson County. For any of you that have visited Union City High School 
along Kennedy Boulevard on 25th Street in Northern Hudson County, you know that's a beautiful building with a baseball and high school field at the rooftop of the building. So I can see that. I mean, that's certainly, if you want to keep encouraging kids to play high school sports, hey, that's great. And also along with two performing art theaters. Now, the Board of Education and District Superintendent have called it a solution to a capacity challenge that they see in the district as it faces more students are indeed continuing to enroll, particularly in the lower grades. No one's surprised Mayor Ravi Bala has publicly endorsed the plan. Now, members of the Coalition Against the Referendum, which are called the Hoboken High School Concerned Citizens Information Exchange, that's a little bit too, too long of a name, folks, and you might, might want to sort of make it a little more concise, take issue with the board's basic theories, and rightfully so, around student population growth, beginning with the fact that the existing building is more than 50% below its maximum capacity. Folks, it's not like Hoboken High School students are being crammed into rooms here, okay? It's pretty spacious, all right? But for many, it's also a starting point why they want the plan rejected. So, for example, Hoboken resident Jerome Abernathy, who spoke with the Jersey Journal, said that the proposal is filled with recreational amenities that seem to be intended to draw in more affluent families who often opt for charter or private schools, which is true, rather than invest in the current students who are largely students of color. Only about 15% of Hoboken public school students are white, while the city is more than 80% white. He also cited test scores that show only 13.6% of the high school students scored high enough to be considered proficient in math, according to federal standards in the most recently reported school year of 2017 to 2018. Folks, listen, I'm all about renovating high schools, giving students new amenities when it comes to their education. You know, don't always hear all the time, according to the NGEA, that New Jersey public schools are the best in the country, right? Well, it depends what district you go to. But the point is that you can have a new high school. And if you're going to come at me with the, the, the notion that we need a new high school, that's fine. I get that. $241 million seems like a very heavy price tag, as I said earlier. Does a school need a swimming pool? Probably not. Do you need an ice hockey rink? I get it. You know, I, you know, ice hockey gets white people all up in an uproar. And, you know, I get it. You know, it's a popular and I love hockey. Don't get me wrong. But when we talk about the needs of what Hoboken High School requires, and if these test score reports are correct, we need to invest money into these programs to make sure that our students in Hoboken are being prepared to go to college, that they are meeting the, the minimum of proficiencies. That doesn't seem to be the case. So while, again, a high ice hockey rink, a pool, two performing arts theaters, I think one is sufficient, to be very honest with you. I mean, we see it at Union City High School. They have a beautiful facility on the, on the rooftop of the school with a very nice football field, a very nice baseball field. And within it, they also have the Union City Performing Arts Center right in the high school. So you can have one, and I think that's enough. But again, folks, you know, people's eyes light up when they see, oh, a new high school, and they want to add this and that. That's all well and good, folks. But we're coming out of a pandemic. People are still getting trying to get back to work. And you know what? For affluent families, for that, you know, a uh, rich couple that moves into Hoboken, right? You know, when they put down their white claw and decide, oh, I don't know, do we want to have a kid or not? Oh, most likely they'll send the kid to private school or a charter school. Okay, let's be honest. That's what happens in Hoboken. All right. But $496, which is what's being looked upon as the average in terms of a, of a property tax increase, they might not mean a lot to that, you know, the white woke couple moving into Hoboken, but to an elderly couple or an elderly family, that means a lot. So, Let's put in perspective, let's be fiscally responsible, and let's see what we can come to a compromise with concerning this high school. Do we need a new high school? Yeah, a newer building, I would say. Do we need to sort of stuff it with all these amenities? Definitely not. And that's our show for this week. To check out all the excellent programming brought to you by the leader in independent media right here in Hudson County, the Hudson Media Group, please check out their websites, www hmgtvshows.com along with www.livestream.com slash hmgtv and also make sure you check out the Hudson Media Group on their YouTube page. Don't forget to like the Hudson Media Group on Facebook and of course follow them on both Instagram and Twitter. And always remember ladies and gentlemen on Wednesday nights live at 9 p.m. Eastern time you can check out the latest edition of the five-time award-winning podcast Talk in the Hudson which airs via www.blogtalkradio.com slash Talk in the Hudson. I'll continue to bring you exclusives that nobody else does in Hudson County media as we approach year five coming up in March of 2022. Make sure you check me out on Instagram, folks, at Professor Fernando Uribe. Also, you can check out this show at Talking Politics with Fernando Uribe. Also, hit me up on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, at No Filter Uribe. And don't forget to check out Talking Politics with Fernando Uribe on Facebook as well. 
And always remember, ladies and gentlemen, if it's unbiased, unfiltered, and unafraid, it's always Talking Politics right here with the Hudson Media Group. I am New Jersey's premier journalist and the sworn enemy of all the toxic progressives, social justice clowns, and woke fools throughout Hudson County and the state of New Jersey. Yes, it's me, Fernando Uribe, saying Happy New Year. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to catch Fernando's podcast at blogtalkradio.com slash talkonthehudson. New episodes available every Wednesday night at 9 p.m.